front spin so far pretty good? Yeah? Cool. I've been working on these slides, so I've been too, did the last minute, like, get push this stuff live to the web, it, like, about uh, 20 minutes ago. So it's all live, but I missed the other talks, unfortunately. Um, I know, it's, it's great. It's really nice, yeah. yeah. All right, I get started here. Uh, so today I'm doing a, a talk on PostGIS and the open cloud, and I'll uh, define kind of what I mean by open cloud in a minute. And uh, we're specifically going to be writing um, uh, highly portable open source mapping applications um, using Leaflet and a uh, little bit of OpenShift. Um, I, there's a bit.ly URL and a full URL if, if you guys are interested in following along. Uh, you, can, you can literally open up these slides and there is no excuses. All of you guys could have a live mapping app by the end of this talk. We could have however many people here all fully deployed and sharing URLs. Um, so really cool stuff. I, I don't know if you've ever set up a full uh, Postgres database in under an hour or you know, deployed a whole app you know, on top of that, right? So this is a lot of, uh, lot of cool content. And I'll uh, try to cram it all into the uh, 45 minutes here. Oh, yeah. You bet. Uh, you know what? I could try to write it up on this uh, whiteboard here if there was some chalk. Here is the bit.ly URL. bit.ly 1tp uh, bqga. And it's case sensitive, so watch out for that. There's the there's the slides, and let's go. So I'm Ryan. Uh, you can also find me as Ryan J on uh, IRC, Twitter, uh, GitHub, um, or uh, Ryan J at RedHat.com. I work at uh, Red Hat on their uh, OpenShift team, uh, doing kind of uh, cloud their their cloud stuff. Uh, and we got a lot of really exciting stuff. I'm going to show you a little bit, a uh, little bit of our stuff, and a lot of uh, kind of the application technology that I that I built on top of it, using a lot of uh, post Postgres, PostGIS stuff. Um, so I'll start off with kind of that open cloud overview, uh, give you guys a little bit of background for uh, people who are new to um, open source cloud technologies. Um, if you guys want to follow along and try to build an app during this workshop, um, you could select from many different languages. I'm mostly, since we have a limited amount of time, I'm just going to focus on JavaScript and Node.js. Um, so hopefully that's interesting for you guys. And if not, um, we have the same solution written in Python and the same solution uh, written in Java. And so you could refer to a couple different uh, example codes and, and take a look and hopefully get something useful out of it. Um, we'll add Leaflet for our uh, client side map interactions. We'll build a simple API, install and configure Post Postgres and PostGIS uh, extensions, um, use environment variables, bootstrap our database, launch an instant mapping solution, and learn about uh, tuning your database. I really hope I could fit all this stuff in. It's a lot of content. So I'll flip through these slides quick. If you have any questions, feel free to shout them out, raise your hand, uh, whatever, and I'll do my best to answer it. Uh, so the cloud, what is it? What is the cloud? Um, you know, there's a lot of different uh, explanations, mostly cat photos, maybe. Uh, but when you're talking about building the cloud um, with open source tools, there's a couple big kind of components you want to you want to use. So infrastructure as a service is a term hopefully you guys have heard of before. There's companies like uh, you know Amazon Web Services and EC2 um, basically offers this. There's a lot of other companies that offer kind of 
uh, a whole box on demand or a virtual machine on demand, right? Um, usually these are virtualized uh, environments. Um, it's composed of a bunch of hardware, of course. And then the software you're going to use is going to be something like uh, OpenStack. Uh, Eucalyptus is another open source infrastructure as a service. CloudStack, SaltStack, these are all good options. My favorite is OpenStack. Um, and the, the end result of infra infrastructure as a service is you have easy on-demand Linux environments or whole boxes, right? But my criticism of infrastructure as a service is it's kind of like a conversation between one ops guy and another ops guy, where one's a vendor and one's a consumer, and they've really kind of left developers completely out of the conversation. Here's a whole box that's not configured at all. You go ahead and configure it and then do the work to maintain it. Right? And that's the real, like, when you run into a dead end on these things is you can come out with, you could quickly customize a box, but what happens when you need to maintain that and keep it up to date? Uh, it becomes a lot more work. Uh, so platforms as a service. Um, that really helps open source the workflows between your operations team and your development team. Uh, usually, there's a lot of contention between these two groups because they have kind of competing goals. The operations team wants to optimize around uptime, uh, not using too many resources, not spinning up too much hardware. Uh, they want to keep the costs low. And developers want to just do everything as quickly as possible and not have to wait for the ops team to respond. So we're going to basically show you workflows for building, hosting, and scaling. Those are the main three things that platform as a service is going to try to solve for you. Uh, and there's a lot of technical uh, underpinnings of how that works. Uh, I could give you more information if you want. I have a, some slightly, a little bit more details in these slides. So uh, in this case, Darth Vader is the operations guy and Luke Skywalker, I don't know if that, that's how you perceive things, but Luke Skywalker is running around trying to mix it up and you know, uh, these guys can finally work together, um, each really working towards their own goals without, without hurting each other. And, you know, the, the great thing about this is um, the discussion ends up shifting towards good policies for how to do auto scaling in response to demand instead of saying, uh, hey, are you done with that VM? I need the memory back or the CPUs back. You, you don't have this fighting back and forth because your hardware scales automatically in response to the amount of network load or CPU load. Um, so that's kind of what we're trying. Oh, here's some terminology warning. I put this on a red slide because this is Red Hat specific. Um, so we have a couple pieces to how we do platform as a service. We have two different machine types. We've got a, a broker that does orchestration. And then we have another machine type uh, called a node. And what we do with those nodes, it's basically a whole box. And we carve out uh, uh, SE Linux containers. And then we use uh, C groups to make a user permission or user uh, resource scope. And each application that's running on top of this platform is kind of in its own. Uh, we call that collection of resources built with SE Linux and C groups. We call that a gear, uh, for lack of a better word. And um, so your application is going to run inside this gear environment. And then we could clone those and load balance across multiple gears. Uh, so that's the idea. Cartridges are kind of our metaphor for extending what you have on a gear. And um, sometimes, uh, for example, if I was running Postgres, I would probably want to put my uh, application in a scalable configuration. What that'll do is it'll put the DB on a separate gear so it has the full, re the full uh, amount of resource allocation just for the DB, and it's not trying to share it with the uh, web server, right? If you do non-scaled, they'll both be bundled together on the same gear, so you have low latency, but um, it's not quite as scalable. Um, also, with that scalable configuration, like I said, we'll clone the front end. We don't clone the back end yet, but I'll have some, uh, some slides on that later. Uh, so we do have a open cartridge format. If, you, if anyone's interested in developing um, add-ons for OpenShift, click on this link. I made this graphic myself. That's not the Nintendo, for, for uh, Nintendo nerds, 
It's not the Nintendo seal of approval. I edited it. It says open source seal on there. Okay. Uh, anyone recognize this, this meme? Normally, it's, it's a trap, right? That's one thing you want to worry about. There's a common meme on the internet, Admiral, Admiral Akbar saying, it's a trap, right? Um, you know, do you want to invest all your time of, of reformatting your code to work on a platform as a service? Maybe, maybe not. Maybe whole boxes are good enough for you. Um, the reason why he's saying seems legit to me is we have uh, kind of no lock-in, and you could use it's open source. Um, we have kind of three different releases of OpenShift. There's uh, Origin. That's all of our open source code. We have a hosted version called OpenShift Online, and then there's an enterprise version that you could run in your own uh, in your own data center. Um, and I think that is all I have for well, maybe a little bit more, but I'll try to keep the OpenShift content to a minimum and keep it on the, the post-GIS stuff. So uh, frameworks, um, these are my starting points for you guys to get running, get up, up and going with a new application. Um, so for Node.js, I recommend using, uh, these are all micro frameworks. Uh, it's a term that gets thrown around, but I like using um, Restify for Node.js. If you wanted to get started, uh, this has kind of like a really simple um, base application in here. Um, I also have a really simple Flask base application that basically just has a web server, um, a dependencies file, and it already has a basic API that just responds on index.html to serve up your, your main web page. And it also has static assets, support for serving static assets. So those are a couple great starting points. Um, that you're going to want to uh, use. Um, you could also, like, Flask is available. For PHP, I like using Silex. It's really simple. Um, for Ruby, there's uh, Sinatra. Um, so those are all great starting points. And we'll get into specifically looking at, um, I'll just open this in a, where, is, where did that go? Open in, I think my full screen is blocking me. All right, so here is the base. I have some config stuff. Ooh, my screen's getting chopped. Some config stuff over here. Uh, static assets, I'll go in this folder. Um, there's an index.html file. And then the two main really critical things for Node.js is you want to have a package.json file. That's going to um, indicate your list of dependencies. This uh, has dependencies on the config module and on Restify. So really simple. Um, it also has something in here that tells your server how to start itself. It's going to run whenever you run npm space start, that'll automatically run uh, node server JS, right? OpenShift actually reads uh, from this one here, main. So you want to have whatever your main script is annotated there in your package.json. And um, by default, we, uh, the default is to load server.js. So you, you could leave those lines out where you're saying specifically server.js, as long as you name your server server.js. If you want to name it anything else, you want to go back in package.json and, and edit it. Here's a basic, um, you know, you could see I'm using require up at the top. Um, that's a global keyword in, in Node.js to um, load NPM packages. So I'm requiring the config module, Restify, and then FS is a built-in module for um, reading and writing to the file system. This is one of the things that is unique to Node.js that you don't get in standard JavaScript. Both the require uh, as well as you know, standard JavaScript, you can't interact with file system at all. So that's some of the uh, nice stuff that, that server-side JavaScript will give you access to. Um, so you could see here we have a couple routes defined. There's a, a status page that just sends an OK response, or a status API endpoint. And then on our main endpoint uh, slash, we just return the index.html and, and do some uh, little switcheroo with the host and port setting. I think this is for local dev, though. Um, you also have down here, this is loading up, serving all your static. Anything that's in static gets served up if it's CSS, JavaScript, or image files. And here's how we start the server. 
Um, the only thing really unique to OpenShift in here is that we're passing in the IP address in addition to the port. That's not always defined with JavaScript uh, or, or with Node.js, but um, OpenShift runs your each app on a different IP, a virtual IP. So you're going to want to make sure to include uh, the IP address. And that gets, we'll see the config file a little bit later. Um, but that's a kind of brief intro to what you can expect from some of these micro frameworks. Um, so you could do git clone on this and have that be your starting point if you wanted to try to hack along with the slides and copy and paste content in. Um, it, so language specific dependencies. So Ruby has Ruby gems, Python has Python eggs, Node.js has these NPM modules. Um, OpenShift will automatically, if you have them detailed, will automatically pull down these requirements and make them available to your app. Um, you could also, I think, check these dependencies into your source code. And there's a debate on, you know, do you want to check in your dependencies or not? For Node.js, it's actually recommended to check in your module dependencies into your source code. But if they're not checked in, we'll, uh, we'll populate those as part of the build process. Um, so you want to also add some language-specific database bindings. So for Node.js, um, this is how you would install something from the command line inside your project. npm install pg query dash dash save. If you run that, it'll add it to your package.json file and list it as a dependency. So that helps keep, whether you check in your node modules, that's where the, the things get loaded to, whether you check all those in or not, um, use that dash dash save and always keep your package.json up to date. Um, same thing for Python, there's a, either settings.py or requirements.txt. You want to have, uh, have, your, have your dependencies listed in there um, to, in order to maximize portability, right? Uh, so for Node.js, I'm going to be using, uh, there's a guy on uh, GitHub, uh, Brian C. I'm going to be using Brian C's uh, PG query module. Um, and that really makes this stuff, it's just standard, post -GI, uh, standard Postgres calls and then a function handler. And that's really, it's really simple. Um, so for local development, if you wanted to spin up a local server with, with a base project or with a completed project, you'd run npm install uh, to install dependencies locally if you don't have them yet, and then npm start. That spins up whatever is dictated in your package.json file. Um, all right, leaflet. So uh, how many people have used leaflet before? Anyone heard of leaflet? Only, wow, OK. All right, leaflet is one of my favorite uh, mapping solutions. It's fully open source. It uses open street maps for the tiles, but you can also modify it to use other map tiles. Um, it has a very simple interface and excellent documentation. Um, I would highly recommend that you guys take a look at their docs because um, they've got yeah, a lot of great stuff. And we'll take a look at some of their code next. If you wanted to use Leaflet in your, uh, you could just slap this into your index.html, index put this in your header. And um, you know, it basically has a style sheet and some JavaScript that Leaflet's going to use. Uh, and I'm loading this right from Leaflet's CDN here. Um, so to initialize your map, uh, this you want to put in a script tag. I put this near the bottom of my, uh, my index file. But um, there's basically a uh, map variable that you're going to initialize. You'll set the view to some coordinates. Um, here I just have it hard-coded to uh, my neighborhood in, in the San Francisco Bay Area. Um, and then there's the final value here is the zoom, the amount of zoom you want. Um, and we'll take a look at what this looks like in a minute. Um, you also have, it looks like this is adding a tile layer. So here I'm using stamen tiles instead of OpenStreetMap tiles. Um, all I did was change this URL. Um, so if you want to use OpenStreetMaps, um, you can put their URL in. You could, there's a variety of different tile solutions you could load in here. Um, and then I have some attribution here. You want to make sure you give people credit, especially open source projects. You know, give them, give them credit for all the work they're doing. 
So I give credit here to Stamen. And uh, the, the data that's encoded into the map, I think the data that they're talking about is the city names are scaled relative to population size. And so that's the data, quote unquote. It's just a city name. But there's some uh, data processing that went into uh, scaling the name. And that was basically data from OpenStreetMap. So next, uh, next up, we actually want to redraw the map whenever someone does a zoom, drag, or when the map loads. Right? Here's our three up top. We've got these three actions that we want to respond to. Um, and I have them down here. Here's the actual functions. I'm setting up some event triggers. And I'm saying whenever, whenever Leaflet detects a zoom event or a drag event or a new map comes on, whenever any of those three events fire off, I am going to run this get pins function. And it's passing in E as the event that fired off in the browser. I'm going to ask the map to get its bounds and say, hey, what's the, the top right and the bottom left coordinate? And it'll get those two mapping points off, uh, pull that from the screen. Um, and then it'll construct a URL here. And then we'll just run uh, get URL. I think this is jQuery or something. Uh, yeah, jQuery. And then we'll use this pin the map function to process the result of whatever comes back from our server. So we haven't defined, um, we haven't defined this endpoint yet. We'll be looking for park slash within is the endpoint we're going to write on the server side. And so for now, this is going to fail, right? But um, yeah, eventually, when, when these map pins come back, we'll clear the current pins and then add the new ones to the map. Pretty simple, right? Any questions about this? Not much to ask about. It's real, real clean. Um, so let's build an API for our map to talk to. Uh, here looks similar to the base application that I started with, right? We have a config. We have Restify. We have FS. The only thing that's new here is I have a module called db.js. That's going to handle all of our DB interaction. All right? I didn't want to muck up my main server file with all this DB-specific code, so separated that into a different module. Um, and then here I'm doing a create server. Uh, cores is to allow cross-site requests. Um, I have a couple endpoints here. Here, let's get all the parks within, and we'll just run db select box whenever the parks within endpoint is hit. So that's just mapping a URL to a function call, and we'll take a look at that function in a minute. But this is how easy it is to define endpoints, API endpoints, with a micro framework. And this is true whether you're using uh, Flask, whether you're using Silex for PHP, whether you're using JAXRS for Java or uh, Sinatra for Ruby, it's going to look similar to this. Um, I already talked about the other stuff in this file. So I'll skip ahead. We'll take a look at setting up Postgres. So if you already have an existing OpenShift application environment, you could run a command like this, cartridge add. RHC is our command line tool. You could install that with Ruby gems, but you run gem install RHC. You sign up for an OpenShift account or host your own OpenShift cluster somewhere. And then you could say, add Postgres. 8.4 was the version we started with. And we currently uh, have 9.2 available. Um, I don't know the specific sub release on that, if it's 9.2.12 or something. But uh, we could look it up if you guys know, if you guys need specifics on that. Um, yeah, there's more information on that. Postgres 9.2 blog post. But that's how easy it is to, if, if someone from the, uh, basically these cartridges allow developers to say, I need this dependency, and it becomes available as part of their application. Um, here is the, so let's just assume that just worked. Postgres is available, right? Uh, it seems like I skipped over something there, right? Um, but uh, the database is available. Let's look at that uh, DB file that I defined and see how we're going to run our queries. Um, so here we have that select box function that I mentioned. Whenever we run slash parks slash within, it's going to hit this function here. 
Um, so here, uh, this request response and next is kind of a standard function parameters on any, um, any API response from either Express or Restify, um, those micro frameworks. The rec variable is going to be the request. Res is your response. You could name those whatever you want. Um, and yeah, uh, so, and I think next is if, if you have something like a web socket, you could kind of keep a continued uh, socket open on here. Um, so I am going to basically look up the query string from the request. We'll parse the URL. I'll try to pull out the lat1 and long1, lat2 and long2. Um, and I also check if someone passed in a limit parameter. That way the clients can do throttling. If you're on a mobile device, they could say, I only want 20 map points at a time, or I don't give me 15,000 map points. You're going to overwhelm my browser, right? So I put that limit parameter in for client-side throttling. Um, and I think I, let's see, is it in the code here? I have in the, oh, yeah, yeah, here, query limit 40. Uh, so I put a default of 40. Someone could override the default query limit, but that's I thought was a sensible default. It at least gives you a, 40 map pins is, is a, something to look at. Um, and then people can manually bump it up if they want more. Um, so here is the response I'm going to send back um, in case they missed any of these parameters. If they don't have lat long, that stuff's missing. I send them an error response. Um, and if it's all available, I use that PG module to make my query. So here, PG is the, the module that I required earlier. And then I'm just going to run a select. Um, here I have a, a transform um, it's tra yeah, it does a, it, it does Sorry, I'm really tired. I was up super late on this stuff. Uh, it, it basically does the geospatial query, and um, the 4326 is the, the format of the data, I think, right? Yeah, yeah, OK, yeah. So you, all right, good. Check with him if you have questions. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, any other questions about this slide? Then it's just going to send back the rows that we got, right? Pretty simple. Map the map the query, get the rows, and then return them back to the back to the map front end. Um, so how did all this get wired together? How am I talking to Postgres with just this PG variable? I didn't specify the IP address. I didn't specify the admin password or the username, any of that stuff. That hasn't been in any of our code, right? We want to have clean and portable code, and there's. Uh, Nothing hard-coded so far, which is good, but some major gaps, right? So let's take a look at where did that stuff, wh what happened to that stuff? So here I'll, I'll do, uh, I'll do a R RHC app create, and I'll say my app and uh, Node.js. Rid of that. Too many arguments. Yeah. Spelled create wrong. Thanks. <laughs> OK, so here it's going to create my application. I just did Node.js here. Um, but that's already going to spin up uh, yeah, a new app for me. And it's going to have some environment variables predefined within this application. Um, you saw how I was connecting to the IP address of the server. Um, there was also a, a port number in the um, server.listen call when we set up our server earlier. Um, so this will come back with some, uh, some environment variables that we'll be able to use uh, when that command completes. Uh, you could also look up any of the environments later by running rhc app show. In fact, I might be able to do that already. OK, here, app is ready. Here it's uh, making the DNS available. Here is my app 2 was the name of the app. I picked this uh, namespace earlier for all of my applications. You could use your, 
You could use your uh, GitHub username, your IRC handle, uh, your maybe your email address, whatever you want for your uh, namespace there. And then if you wanted to do team collaboration, you could assign a uh, team member uh, write privileges or update privileges, SSH access on your uh, subdomain there. Um, so here you could see we have a, a URL already available. There's a SSH address. We could SSH into our app. We have a Git remote and a local copy of our source here in the My App 2 folder. Here's our local source. I could do RHC SSH to connect to this thing over SSH. And uh, I could also run RHC app show to see the details. Here's the same details from earlier, echoed back, right? Um, if I had Postgres installed, it would also have, I'll just do that right now, RHC uh, cartridge add Postgres 9.2. And we'll add that to our Node.js app. Oh, PostgreSQL. That, uh, that's not a full list there. That's just the list of guesses. It's chopping off the side of my, let me know if, if I lose part of the text there. But that's a partial list of um, cartridges based on what I typed. OK, here we go. We got our root user root password, database name, a connection string. That came up pretty quick, right? Um, and now if I go back to this SSH environment, um, I'm going to need to log in again because the environment variables for connecting to Postgres got added after this shell session got started. So here I could SSH back in. Um, I could use just standard SSH as well, but at RHC SSH is kind of a shortcut uh, that, that runs SSH and then the long connection string that you guys saw earlier. Uh, so here I could do ENV and then grep for something like DB. So here's all my DB connection strings that my application is going to use. So you write your applications to refer to environment variables in order to keep your code clean. And so let's take a look at the uh, config file I have. Um, that's Restify base. Let's find Restify post GIS. Actually, I have this in the slides as well. Um, here is the config file. I basically created as a module. This is what the uh, config module for Node.js expects. And I have a similar file for Flask, my Flask application, and, and my Ruby application as well. And so this has a lot of conditional assignments. First, it checks for process.env port. Uh, for Node.js, process is your main thread that's running. ENV is your environment relative to that process. And uh, OpenShift doesn't define dot, we don't define port. Uh, Heroku does. So theoretically, this might be able to run on Heroku, but maybe not. I haven't actually tried it, so probably not. But it, I would love to have these be super portable applications to any open cloud platform, not just a, a Red Hat one, right? Um, but this is how you could shim in as many different environment variables as, as you want. Um, in order to populate the config.port variable. Um, we're also going to populate uh, an IP address, and we're going to have a connection string for Postgres. All of these have a fallback at the end. Um, here's our sensible fallback for local development. So if I run this same code in local dev, it's going to start up on 127.0.0.1 port 3000. If I run it on OpenShift and the environment variables are available, it'll take advantage of the environment variables. If I run it somewhere else and they have different environment variables, I include it in this file and my code instantly can run on that other platform, right? Um, so this is one of the keys to writing your ultra portable uh, code that'll run just about anywhere. Um, if you, you could also set custom environment variables. So one thing that, uh, like a lot of applications have a Google Analytics tracker key. You don't necessarily want to hard code that into your source, right? Especially if you're going to deploy to several different URLs. 
Um, so you can specify this as here I have a uh, secret token with a bunch of junk in here, right? I could run E and V set secret token. It sets my environment variable. I could do E and V list. I could see it's populated there. And if I go back to SSH and connect, I have to reload the session. But I could check in there, and that secret key would also be populated in here. E and V grep secret. There's the same, same secret token, right? So that's another way to keep your code super nice and clean. Um, if you want any help with that, RHC E and V help has a lot of detail. Yeah? I'm doing this with OpenShift Online. So this is live right now. This, like, anyone can go to this URL up top right now with your cell phone, anything. Anyone can. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh-huh. Uh -huh. Yeah, this, this here is running on my laptop here, um, setting the environment. Um, and I also had a shell open as well. So here's. Yep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the way that works is it uses uh, this, this command line tool I'm using is talking to OpenShift has a REST API. So you could, there's a lot more that you could do with the REST API if you really wanted to do heavy automation. Um, that REST API has the most number of features. The command line has a little bit less. And then we have a web interface as well. Um, the web interface, you can't set these environment variables yet. Uh, so that's one thing I'd really love to see added into the, the web interface. Yeah, good, good question, though. Um, OK, so let's get back to slides. All right, environment variables. Uh, OK, here you could even supply additional environment variables during your app creation process. Um, so unfortunately, this is a, a demo I was working on for Code for America. They have a, a app called Adopt a Hydrant, and it basically maps all the fire hydrants in, in town. And their problem was when it snowed, these fire hydrants would get covered up in, in a bunch of snow, and someone would need to dig them out. And so they had neighborhood representatives that would volunteer, I'm going to adopt this hydrant. And then they had kind of a social app where you could see, hey, so and so is maintaining that the, you know they've all, all these neighborhood volunteers are filling the gap, you know, uh, between uh, for a lack of government services, right? And you really have citizen-driven applications that that are really powerful. And this is exactly the type of thing you would want to be portable. Uh, they also spun this up in Hawaii, and instead of there's no snow there, but they have a uh, um, these sirens that alert, uh, alert you if there's a tsunami warning. And they had all these birds that were nesting in these sirens. And they would need to go keep these uh, tsunami alert sirens clean of, of all these nesting birds. And so that was a, a, another same similar source code, slightly adapted. But hopefully, they could have a common base and then just a different style sheet on top. Or you know, just minor differences, right? Um, so this one actually, that yeah, you could see how you could specify an environment variable here. Um, but yeah, this one, it takes too long to build, and it, and it fails on, on OpenShift. We need to clean up our build process to run a little bit quicker or, or allow for longer, longer build times, um, at least when you're doing your app create statement. If I do this in two steps, where I create a Node.js or a, a Ruby app, add Postgres, and then add the code, it works just fine. But I, this one-liner is where it gets really powerful. Um, so if you're doing really advanced DB services, like let's say you have a local development machine and you want to talk to your remote Postgres. Here I'm back in my local development. I could run RHC port forward. And that will make some local connections to my remote DB available. Um, also, my remote server. So I could go here. Oh, where's my mouse? I could go here and load up this URL, and it will 
proxy through to my remote environment. Same thing with the Postgres. So if you have PG admin or something locally, boom, there's, there's your URL. Um, you can also, I have a blog post on how to use local development and develop against your remote OpenShift server. So if you're on a locked down laptop where you're not allowed to install Postgres, spin up an OpenShift environment, set up the port forward, boom, you're done, right? Um, so yeah, good, good stuff there as well. We also have a post on how to connect to existing Postgres services from an OpenShift front end. So if you had a big, inter, you know, your own PG database that's large, um, you could talk to your own PG database instead of these small OpenShift ones. We're kind of spinning up a, a separate single serve PG for each development environment. And if you wanted to talk to a central, you know, Postgres master or one of your slaves, you know, you, you hit, that, hit that second link there and we'll have more information on how to get that done. Um, so automating your DB setup. Um, these, there's still some remaining work here. We've got just about everything done, but we haven't enabled PostGIS. We haven't created our table schema. Um, we haven't added our geospatial index. We haven't injected our data into our application. Um, let's take a look at how that stuff might work. Um, so here I have, uh, there's a dot OpenShift folder where we'll allow you to define um, some action hooks. Um, action hooks are basically just scripts. Uh, this one is a bash script. Um, if it's a Ruby script, that's fine. We just try to run the script if it's defined. And we have a couple different scripts. This one is called deploy. So this gets run on every deploy. There's also a one called build and pre-build and post-build. And you know, it, depending on what you want to automate, you could hook into several different parts of the process and run an arbitrary script to help set up your database. I actually relocated all of the code into uh, something uh, that's actually run via my package.json. I didn't want my code to be really specific to OpenShift. I wanted anyone to be able to initialize their DB, even if they weren't an OpenShift user. So let's jump back to the package.json and see where that init thing is defined. Whoop, wrong file. That's all of our data here, uh, package.json. So here you could see in scripts, instead of just the start script, we have a couple other ones. There's build, there's flush db, um, init db. Um, so there's a couple different things. And this just runs npm run init db. OK, which runs node bin bootstrap. So let's go take a look at uh, bin bootstrap. I have some of that code here in the slides. So here, similar to what we saw before, we're relying on that config to not refer to anything about how to log in to our database. We're using PG query for super clean, easy queries. Um, here I'm finding the, uh, the remote connection string from config and the table name. I'm going to make my DB connection here. Um, I'm going to grab all of our uh, points that's in a JSON file. And I'm going to start loading these into the, into the database. So the first function we call is initDB. Um, initDB basically just adds the PostGIS extension and then runs this callback afterwards, create DB schema. So these basically chain together. Node.js does everything asynchronously. So if you want to run things in order, you use callbacks like this. So here we're creating the DB schema next. And here it checks for errors and then uh, goes and runs this create table. It creates all the table schema here. Um, and finally, we end up adding the spatial index. Uh, here, and then importing our map points. Let's see, I think I do a small amount of translation here. Query print. Yeah, I did some kind of translation. There was a um, quote marks in the file that was breaking the query structure. So I did a little search and replace to put double quotes around the single quote. I don't know. Uh, that's the only kind of tweak I needed to make with our input data. So that's it. We've got, we've got results for Node.js. 
here is the resulting application. Um, and if you guys want to give that a try, for, for Python Flask, you can go to flask-postgis. These are all the fully completed apps with everything I've been talking about. Uh, we also have a Java and Hibernate solution. I don't know if that one works as an instant app. And I'll show you real quick. And we're pretty much out of time. Um, but here is what it would look like. Here's any kind of app creation for OpenShift. You type in RHC app create, the name of the app, however many uh, cartridge dependencies you need. You could also specify your source code. And then so specifically here, we could run something like this in order to spin up a new, I call this Parks 4 maybe. I don't know how many of these Parks apps I have. I got a lot of them. Here's a live demo of the completed result. So here are map points set on Boston. When I drag out, we got some more points added. As I pan over, anytime I pan or zoom, it's redrawing all the points with a limit of 40. Right? Pretty fast. Um, and the, the parks data is just national parks and historic sites. I could click on any of these pins and see what any of these uh, points are. Uh, I also added for, how many of you guys have seen the clone me on GitHub banners? I, I, I'm a fan of the clone me on GitHub kind of ribbon that people have, but I modified it so it says run me on OpenShift, right? So with this click, this goes right into our web-based workflow for creating apps. So here I could create parks five. Um, here's my Git source. I could say, hey, I need extra memory. Give me a larger size environment. It already has Python and Postgres listed as my dependencies. All this stuff was just encoded into the link here in the URL. Um, so yeah, create application, turn scaling on and off. Um, that's one, you know, two clicks. Click on the ribbon, click on create if they already have an OpenShift account. And you can host your own OpenShift. So, um, Really, really cool stuff there with that web-based uh, workflow for creating apps. And I have a post on how to customize that workflow and construct those URL strings. So whether you like the ribbon or not, if you want to give someone a link that says launch my app, look up that post and we've got info on how you can, uh, how you can really compose these apps based on source code and a list of cartridge dependencies. Uh, here's a post on how to make those ribbons and add the ribbons to your app. Uh, tuning Postgres. I'm out of time, but I'm going to run like two minutes over if you guys are OK with that. All right. This is some of the good stuff here. Uh, where the heck did my pghba.conf go? And where's postgresql.conf? Uh, as a developer, I don't usually, like our theory is developers shouldn't have to mess with this stuff. This should be stuff that the operations team and the developers are collaborating on, uh, a conversation about how we scale. And do we scale? horizontally in small chunks at a time, or do we scale in larger chunks at a time? But either way, we should have a focus on horizontal scaling and redundancy, right? So let's, let's get the developers out of these files, give them easy on-demand environments, and the ops team can tune the uh, Postgres cartridge. Developers can also tune it a bit. We have some environment variables, this uh, post, OpenShift PostgreSQL shared buffers allows you to set the number of shared buffers. You can also set the number of max connections. These are all settable just with that RHC ENV set for, uh, for setting environment variables. Um, and then that'll go into effect. You may need to reload your database to, to pick those up, but you know, pretty easy. And a lot of the stuff you see in this uh, wiki page on tuning your Postgres server is pretty easily doable on, on OpenShift. Um, other advanced configurations. So here's one issue. I was talking with the guys from uh, Crunchy Data. Have you guys heard of anyone familiar with Crunchy Data? We'll check this out. These guys gave me a warning that they had some issues with the uh, Postgres 9.2 cartridge with the statistics collector. And I, I don't know if this was like after a million records or after a, after a certain amount. It's a scale that I haven't hit yet with my tiny little demo apps. But they say after a certain number of uh, iterations, the statistics collector was a little bit buggy in our Postgres 9.2 cartridge. So what did they do? They 
uh, they created their own Postgres 9.3 cartridge for OpenShift. Um, this is something that you can run right away. Um, you know how I did that RHC cartridge add? You could specify the URL of this and add Postgres 9.3. Even though we don't support it, we don't. We don't. We won't answer the phone calls. And and when you say, hey, my Postgres 9.3 is busted, we're going to be like, hey, we don't. It's not in our list of supported stuff. But um, you can opt in to running arbitrary cartridges from GitHub. Uh, so that's definitely something good to look at. Uh, this Postgres 9.3 cart from Crunchy Data. Also, they have a 9.4 devel with the RLS patch available. Um, and if you wanted to do highly available Postgres um, on open sh in your enterprise environment, um, they've got solutions for that as well. So they just had a big um, kind of a, a launch announcement. And they'll do load balancing, geographic failover, master-slave replication, and, and other things. Um, but yeah, there's a link to this uh, post if you want information on uh, bringing all this technology in-house into your own uh, data center. Um, I think that's about it. We accept pull requests. We want help with everything. We use PEPs for our uh, major, that's what Python uses. It's a project enhancement proposal. We use that for our major feature enhancements. You could track all of our, everything we do is public. Everything we do is open source. Just check us out online and you could see what we're up to. We also have this uh, third party index for, um, and here's where you could find, if you go to originly.com, you could add your own cartridge solutions or find other third party cartridges that people like Crunchy Data are building. Um, so there's a link to those cartridges. And let's see if I could wrap this up. Uh, oh, we've got some really cool stuff for Docker coming up in the future. Keep an eye on, on uh, OpenShift and our Docker support. OpenShift Origin is our upstream, like I said. Online, three apps, everyone can run that. And uh, that's about it. If anyone clicked on that, on that ribbon at the, in, the, in the mapping app, they ought, to have, uh, they ought to be live with their own mapping solution. Click there and you could be live with your own app. All right? I think that's it for me. Thanks, uh, thanks for sticking around.